everyone. My name is Rick Speck, Community Engagement for Safe in West Michigan. We'd like to say some hellos to some folks that are in the chat. Hey, Robert, how you doing? Mary Lynn, welcome. Good to see you, Audrey Ann. You can add your location and name into the chat and we'll be able to welcome you. Hi, Jennifer, how you doing? We're really looking forward to a great, great evening. Skylar Rich from Grand Rapids, Anna, our, our esteemed chairperson from Detroit. How y'all doing? So glad you could be here. Jennifer Williams, Kenneth Ward, Sharon from Lansing, Ken Wards from Utah. How you doing, Mary from Oakland County Youth Assistance? Robin from Lansing. Always good to see Richard and Carol Reinstra from Grand Rapids. Hi, Eric, how you doing? Eric from East Lansing, East Lansing. Amanda Hall from the ACLU from Kentucky. Good to see you in the room tonight. How you doing, Walter from Ipsy? We have Michelle Reed joining us from Massachusetts. Bonnie and John from Lansing. So many folks joining us. Hey, Adam, how you doing? Adam K from Ipsy. All kinds of folks in the room tonight. How you doing, Don? Don and Marie. Allison from Sato, how you doing? Oh yeah, Mike, we ain't gonna forget you in the UP. Good to see ya. Barb Hankey from Oakland County, welcome. So good to see so many folks in the room. Joe, Joe Haverman from Hope Network, good to see you. Eileen Hayes, another one of our esteemed board members. How you doing, Therese? I hope it goes great too. Jerome, welcome. So many people joining us this evening. Yep, Mary, Mary Lynn, we, we have people from all over. Isn't it amazing how many folks? Yes, it is awesome to see West Michigan represented today. Danny, what's happening? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Daniel Jones from my semi American Friends Service Committee. Always good to see you. I looking good. I gotta look good like you, my man. I'm trying to keep up. Monica, how you doing? Kristen, so good you're here. Look forward to seeing you on tomorrow's call as well. So at this time, I'd like to take a minute to thank some of our sponsors for this evening. Premier Finishing, our partners at 42 North Partners, Integral, Ashok, uh, the Calder Group, Hope Network, Nation Outside, the Youth Justice Fund, Aaron, Mario, and Adam, Americans for Prosperity, and Church of the Servant. Some of our other sponsors we'd like to thank this evening include Michigan Faith in Action, Anna Cohn, Center for Behavioral Health and at Wayne State University, Recovery Park. Of course, Monica at Arrow Advocacy Reentry, Resources and Outreach of Lansing, all of our friends at Just Leadership USA, Friends of Restorative Justice, and the Jewish Community Relations Council. Thank you so much this evening for your sponsorship. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to the Executive Director of Michigan Faith in Action and SJM Board Member for the Welcome and Blessing. Welcome, Marlene. Thank you so much, Rick. I'd like to thank Safe and Just Michigan for this opportunity to address us in this uh, virtual gathering with an invocation. I will ask for this blessing in my Christian faith tradition. So let us pray. We come before you now in the midst of a global pandemic at the tail end of a heated campaign season in the year marked for vision 2020. We're reminded that through you, Lord, we can only seek clarity and vision, but we can also seek justice. Psalm 9415 says, 
justice will once again meet up with righteousness and all those whose heart is right will follow. On this evening of celebration of all of the great works of Safe and Just Michigan, let us be the ones to rise up for righteousness and justice will prevail. Amen. And now let me turn this over to our esteemed new board chair, Anna Cohn. Anna? On behalf of the board and staff of Safe and Just Michigan, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight at our 2020 annual meeting. My name is Anna Cohn, the new president of Safe and Just Michigan. This year's annual meeting is unique in many ways, and we're excited to share this historic evening with you, which happens to be Safe and Just Michigan's 20th anniversary. While Safe and Just Michigan has come so far in these past two decades, I can't imagine that anyone in our network could have anticipated the unexpected derailment of our professional and social agendas during this past year. While our lives may have been forever changed due to the losses and challenges we faced during COVID-19, I know that our incarcerated brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters have likely felt the harshest effects of this pandemic. Some of us have been restricted from visits with our loved ones, while others among us are mourning losses of our loved ones. Our thoughts in particular are with them this evening. Please join me in a moment of silence for the many lives lost among our justice involved population. Thank you. While Safe and Just Michigan continues to advocate to reduce the harm caused by crime and incarceration, we have also been a resource to many Michiganders, including elected officials, on evidence-based policies and practices to continue serving those most harmed by our criminal justice system for 20 years. Our journey from being a strongly committed group of leaders who established the Citizens Alliance on Prisons and Public Spending to expanding our vision and goals as we became Safe and Just Michigan has been a journey we're humbled to share with you all. Thanks to our members, supporters, and of course our devoted staff to making this 20 year anniversary possible. I've been part of Safe and Just Michigan for almost eight years. And those eight years have been especially memorable because of how much I've learned from my fellow board members, three of whom will be retiring after this evening's election. I wish to personally thank these gentlemen for their commitment to Safe and Just Michigan since its establishment 20 years ago as CAPS. To my colleagues, Mike Reagan, our secretary, Bill Tregay, our treasurer, and of course, retiring president, Mike Visna, our hats are off to you. Mr. Visna, though I have big shoes to fill, I am so grateful for the pathway you and our retiring officers have laid for this next generation of leaders. Later in our program, we'll hear more from our beloved Barbara Levine about these leaders' servant leadership. At this time, it is my great honor to introduce Safe great and Just Michigan's Executive Safe Director, Michigan's John Executive Cooper, Director. to our virtual stage. So uh, people who receive expungements in Michigan are less likely than a member of the general public to commit another crime and see on average a 23% increase in income within a year of getting their records sealed. So not to put too fine a point on it, but the clean slate package is a big deal. As I said in our press release about legislative passage, this is a milestone in state criminal justice, uh, criminal record sealing policy that will help hundreds of thousands of people in Michigan um, and will drive the national conversation on reform forward. Um, among other things, it's the first automatic expungement law in the country to automatically seal many felony records, and it's the first to not condition eligibility on unpaid criminal justice debt. Um, so while we're super excited about passage of the Clean Slate Package, our work is not done. First, implementation funding for the automatic expungement still needs to be secured and there's a two-year implementation period attached to the bill. We're gonna to need to continue to put pressure on the legislature and the governor's office to fully fund Clean Slate and implement it as quickly as possible. We also need to get the word out about the new law to as many people as possible, and we need to build a network of support for people that may need assistance determining their eligibility and navigating the petition process. Finally, we need to work to keep expanding the automatic expungement. Many convictions are not eligible for it, and it applies to a limited number of convictions. The petition process also needs streamlining, and there's much work to be done on juvenile records as well. And on that note, I wanna 
uh, flag for your attention, SB uh, 681 and 2, um, which our partners at the Michigan Center for Youth Justice are supporting. Um, that addresses many of the concerns about juvenile records, and those bills deserve your support. Um, but thank you so much for your help in getting the Michigan Clean Slate campaign this far. We couldn't have done it without you. Let's keep the pressure on and finish the job. Next, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge one of SJM's key partner organizations in the Clean Slate campaign, Nation Outside. As you may know, SJM became Nation Outside's fiscal sponsor in July, and our very own Troy Reinstra has become Nation Outside's program director, a role that he will be transitioning to full-time in the coming year in an effort to build Nation Outside into an independent statewide organization of formerly incarcerated people that works to change the narrative around formerly incarcerated people and influence state criminal justice policy conversations. We are looking forward to supporting the growth of Nation Outside and continuing to partner with Troy and Nation Outside on path-breaking campaigns like Clean Slate. A discussion of our work this year wouldn't be complete without mentioning COVID-19. The onset of COVID-19 pandemic in March upended our year like everybody else's. We closed our office, had to scramble to move the already planned events like Day of Empathy online, and we had to figure out how to work effectively together from makeshift home offices across the state. It also created urgent advocacy needs related to our criminal justice system and the people incarcerated within it. New safety protocols were needed as were proactive releases of vulnerable people and steps to stem the flow of people in the system and reduce unnecessary contacts with it. And impacted families needed accurate information and support. In response, SJM worked with a broad coalition of partner organizations to help meet these needs. We worked with partners to create a website compiling resources and information about the COVID response in jails and prisons. We partnered with our friends at AFSC to start a family support group that has been meeting weekly since March. We produced webinars making the case for releases and identifying the barriers to broader releases, such as commutation procedures, truth in sentencing, and unfounded fears about violent crime recidivism. And we pushed these issues in the media and on social media. Finally, we worked with partners to put direct pressure on policymakers, both in the legislature and the governor's office, to do what was needed to protect incarcerated people from COVID. As many of you know, these efforts were more successful with jails, courts, and local justice systems than they were with Michigan's prisons. And for several months, Michigan led the country in cases in its correction system and COVID deaths. The recent outbreak at the prison in Muskegon, um, which is the largest in the state currently, is a reminder that the danger has not passed and that our advocacy is still needed. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, the 20 year anniversary of our organization. As many of you know, we were founded as CAPS 20 years ago and were led for most of our organization's life by Barbara Levine and then Laura Sager. Barb and Laura defined the problem, the mission, built the case in the organization, and in my mind, they deserve more credit than anyone here tonight for what Safe and Just Michigan has become and what our organization has accomplished. In addition, they were both great mentors to me. It's not an exaggeration to say that I couldn't have done this job without them. So on behalf of all the SJM team and everyone joining us tonight, thank you, Barbara and Laura, for everything you've done to build our organization and advance criminal justice reform in Michigan. So thanks again for joining us tonight. I'll now turn things over to my colleagues, Annie and Josh, for a policy and research update. Hi, I'm Dr. Ann Mahar, and I am the Research Specialist at Safe and Just Michigan. We've had a busy and exciting year. We just recently released our first issue brief as Safe and Just Michigan, and it focuses on the history and the impact of the felony firearm statute. As some of you may already know, it is a felony in Michigan to be in possession of a firearm when committing a felony, and you can get a mandatory two-year sentence that is entirely at the discretion of the prosecutor. Obviously, I think you should go read the uh, issue brief that we just released, but some key findings are that 50% of the people incarcerated in Michigan for felony firearm were convicted in Wayne County, and over 85% of those who are sentenced for felony firearm are identified as black. 
Another area of research that we are focusing on is issues of sentencing in Michigan. So we are spending a lot of time looking at the decisions made in the late 90s about the Michigan Sentencing Guidelines and Truth in Sentencing. The Michigan Sentencing Guidelines were intended to normalize felony sentences, but our current research looking at uh, life max sentences shows that it has not worked quite as we intended. And additionally, when we added the habitual offenders to the sentencing guidelines, it's made a very large impact. The other side of the late 90s decisions is truth in sentencing. We've had a very long history of good time in Michigan with the first statute being in 1857, and we've seen a lot of changes since then. Our research is looking at understanding that complex legal history the impact that it's had on Michigan citizens, our correctional system, and how to best fix those errors. The last area of research that we're focused on is community reinvestment. Decades of research in criminology have shown that uh, money spent on communities most impacted by crime, um, having that money directly go to them and community reinvestment has a greater impact on crime and violence than putting that money into the criminal justice system. Recent research has shown that the addition of new nonprofits in those most impacted communities has a negative impact on crime. Thank you for supporting our work and please follow our blog and us on social media in order to keep up to date with our research. Thank you. And now I'd like to pass it to my colleague, Josh Ho. Hi, my name is Josh Ohm, Policy Analyst at Safe and Just Michigan. Uh, this has been a pretty exciting year. As John already mentioned at the top of the whole broadcast, we've been working very hard on something called the Clean Slate, uh, bringing Clean Slate Initiative to Michigan, which is the idea is to make it so that people after they've done their time and after they've spent a lot of time in the community crime free, they're able to actually get employment again, get housing again, without having their record be a, be a problem. And you know, we think this is gonna help hundreds of thousands of people across Michigan. It's already uh, been through the House, it's already been through the House Judiciary Committee, it's already been through the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now we just need to vote on in the Senate, and then it'll move to the, floor, uh, to the Senate floor, and then after the Senate floor, hopefully we get a reconciliation between the House and Senate and it becomes law. So we're really excited about that. We really believe it's gonna help a lot of Michiganders get over what is, I think, one of the biggest hurdles for people returning from incarceration, which is this notion that they can't get employment and they can't get uh, housing, which are critical to you know, preventing things like recidivism. So uh, another thing that's related to that, there's a package of bills on, on occupational licensing uh, across the, that, that, you know, there's a lot of times when people come back from incarceration, even if they're really good at something like cutting hair, sometimes the inability to get an occupational license means they can't even do that once they get back, even though that's a skill they have. Luckily, uh, throughout Michigan, uh, people have been working on this for a long time. That package has already moved through the House and now it's moving on to the Senate. So we're really hopeful, again, that we get some really good legislation out of this and that it continues to move forward. As we've been kind of dealing with the COVID crisis, uh, you know, the policy team at Safe and Just Michigan has also been working on a huge number of webinars to try to bring you more information about all the different things we've been doing uh, across the state. We've done webinars on everything from the aforementioned clean slate to multiple different uh, things about the jails task force, which we'll be talking about in just a second, and about some of the other things that we've been working on. So one of the biggest projects we've been working on all year is the progress of the, what were the recommendations of the Michigan Task Force on Jail and Pretrial Incarceration. Uh, this was a really large undertaking. The, the, uh, a large group of stakeholders were brought together by the Speaker of the House, the Leader of the Senate, and uh, the Governor to try to uh, figure out what's, why it is that Michigan has declining arrest rates but increasing incarceration in our jails uh, as opposed to our prisons. And, you know, I was just talking to a friend from the Brennan Center a couple days ago where they were talking about how much trouble they were having getting information on things like misdemeanor arrests across the country. And we were really lucky in Michigan that we had the Pew Charitable Trust come to town and they were able to get all the different counties, you know, we have 83 counties in Michigan, uh, to work together to actually collect the data
actually collect the data, because right now we don't have a uniform system for collecting that data. And they were able to kind of unite all those different counties, bring them together and get a bunch of data. And then a bipartisan group of people who were working on a task force sat down, sifted through all that data and came up with a bunch of recommendations to try to make Michigan's jails, as opposed to their prisons, uh, more just and better for people in Michigan. And they came out with a very long list of 18 uh, recommendations that have now been turned into legislation and finally started to make their move through the Michigan legislature. Just uh, a week ago, the first several bills, which were about getting rid of mandatory minimums for jail terms, were introduced. Today, while we're actually recording this, uh, they're, they're in the Michigan uh, Judiciary House Judiciary Committee, they're discussing a second wave of bills, which are talking about getting rid of driver's license suspensions. And what most people may not know is that uh, in Michigan, one of the largest drivers of incarceration in the entire state is things that are unrelated to actual problems with your driving, but still result in your driver's license being suspended. And so one of the things we're really hopeful for is that as a result of this package and of this legislation is that a lot of people, for instance, in Detroit, where there isn't good public transportation, are not forced into situations where they have to choose between going to work or dealing with a suspended license. And that's what happens far too often. There's a lot of other things happening in this group of, like I said, there were 18 recommendations. And over the next few weeks, they'll, we'll see more bills coming out in the House and the Senate. And hopefully by the time you see this, some of them have actually started to move toward the floor and hopefully will become law very soon. Now I'd like to throw it over to my colleagues, Rick and Troy. Hey. <laughs> we made it. We Thank made you. it. Thank you, Manny and Josh, for your update. Uh, we know there's technical work that you do. Everything's technical in the midst of the COVID era. And uh, we thank you for all the work that you do. So we just want to take a minute to give some shouts out. Acknowledge all those people out there doing great work in the field right now in the midst of adjusting and adapting to a, a different world. So, Rick, who, who do we know who's doing great things? Well, I, I got to give a shout out to Nick Johnson over at Fresh Coats Alliance, my co-host on CJ Cafe. What's happening, hey, Nate? We see, you. we see you in Muskegon. Laura Sager, I know that John gave you some honors and praise, but I want to thank you for bringing me in to Safe and Just Michigan three years ago. I appreciate all the, the mentoring that you've done with me, the chance that you gave me, and we love you. Yeah, Aaron Kinzel, the U Justice Fund, his team, Mario Adam, Audra. Natalie, Natalie Holbrook, the, the friends, Natalie friends and the whole team at American Friends Services are killing it. You're doing great work and keep on representing the people living behind bars because we know that they can't speak for you for themselves. You're doing an excellent job. Yeah, Alan's thrown out MCYJ. Definitely want to shout them out. Yeah, uh, we got to lift up uh, Gerald Carwell, uh, Reverend Carwell from Michigan Faith in Action. Always, we, we miss you. We need you in this field. So stay up. Yeah, Alyssa Gunderson from the Public Defender's Office, social worker out of there, doing great work in Muskegon. Who else we got? We got Citizens for Prison Reform, doing an excellent job representing the families. Yeah, Sado, Mari, Allison, Jose, that whole squad over there at Sado doing great work. Yeah, did, did we get Monica yet? We, we better. We better get Monica Janner, board member, Safe and Just Michigan. Arrow, we love you. You're running Lansing. You keep representing. You keep representing the formerly incarcerated family. That's right. Uh, Audrey Anderson wants to lift up notes from the village. Liberate, don't incarcerate. Citizens for prison reform. Absolutely. Notes from the village. Notes from the village. We need to get in touch with them while yeah. we're networking. Who Definitely Eileen Hayes, Michigan Faith in Action, big supporter and partner of ours. National Network for Justice. Reform Alliance, the Sensia Project, American Conservative Union, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and we'd be remiss if we didn't shout out the Clean Slate Initiative. And, and I'd get, probably get kicked off the board if I didn't shout out National Network for Justice, uh, touching the whole country with great leaders around uh, in every state. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, 
you know, I, I want to give a shout out too, to uh, Juwan Bland from uh, uh, Moses. They're doing really good work. I, I'd like to definitely lift them up. Can't forget about Cozine over at Brighter hey, Way. Brighter Way down in Washtenaw County. And I, I got to, if I don't acknowledge what my mom just put in there, Allies for Greyhounds doing great work behind bars in cold water, uh, rescuing the Greyhounds. That, that's, that was my pathway home. So I want to thank them for their work. Yeah. Just so, much. so many great orgs out there doing just amazing work. Humanity for Prisoners out of Muskegon. Dina, we see you. Alan Wachendorfer, uh, Nation Outside Board, board Chair. Yeah. Uh, Michigan we, Liberation. Uh, we got Nick Buckingham, Earl, all them down there, Kimberly, all, all that squad. Yeah, absolutely. Just so many folks. I mean, such a great year for reform here in Michigan this year. It just seems, you know, amongst this COVID, the, the one thing that's been moving is, is we've been moving some legislation. So we got a lot to be proud of this year. Yeah. Yeah, Monica, definitely the governor's task force on pretrial and jails. Absolutely. Got to gotta give a lift up to them. Got to shout them out. I'm passing yeah. it to you, Rick. Yeah, Kathy wants to lift up Friends of Restorative Justice. Alan says, Hudson Weber, Philip. NAMI, Lansing and NAMI, Washington with mental health courts and mental health education in jail. Thank you, Angela. Everyone is speaking truth to power tonight. What about you, Trey? Is there anyone else you can think of? Uh, man, I'm about full. I think that we, I think that- Oh yeah, Jose's throwing out Pat Bates, the host of Living on LOP. Another oh. great, great initiative that came out. Last episode coming out when? You know what? I should know that, but you're absolutely right. The the last episode is coming out. Um, yeah, right this right. week. This week coming up. Decarceration Nation. Decarceration Nation. Uh, Josh Ho on the microphone podcast. That's right. Hello. So again, we want to we want to thank Hello. everybody who's in the field. I begin by thanking John and Kate for the opportunity to publicly express my appreciation to the newly retiring board members and to the board as a whole. Preparing these remarks really brought back a lot of memories for me. When we put the original board together in October of 2000, there were 20 members. Of those, six proved to be extraordinarily committed to the organization. Bob Grosvenor, who was the president until his death in 2008, was always available to give me advice and good counsel. Ron Bratz, who took over from Bob as president, did everything asked of him until just a few years ago when he finally turned his full attention to his own well-earned retirement. Bob Brown, who kept attending meetings when he was coping with serious health issues, lent his expertise and his reputation up until he passed until 2019. And then there were three. This year, it's Mike Reagan and Bill Tregay's turn to retire. Of the original 20, only Gary Ashby will be left to provide institutional memory. Two other board members were also exceptionally committed. Kathleen Schaefer left the board in 2018 after 12 years, including a long stint as president. And Mike Vizna left just a few months ago, also after serving a term as president. All these board members, as well as the many others who served for fewer years, brought to the table their unique experience, knowledge, and commitment to the issues. They came from very diverse backgrounds and many carried the hope that our work would ultimately result in a shift of resources from corrections to services that they were intimately involved in implementing. They had a vision of how much better things could be. Mike Reagan understood the importance of substance abuse treatment long before drug courts became fashionable. Mike Vizna understood the importance of providing mental health care in the community as a way to prevent incarceration long before people started to express concern about jails and prisons as the treatment system, mental health treatment system of last resort. Bill Tregay understood how life-changing a college education could be for prisoners and fought relentlessly for the restoration of Pell Grants and the provision of higher education to Michigan prisoners. They all hung in, even though the MDOC budget kept growing and everything was harder to do and slower to happen than we ever anticipated. 
Many specific goals still remain unmet, but in fact, things are different today. Public attitudes have shifted, and opportunities to address mass incarceration from multiple angles have grown. I hope every board member feels that he or she has contributed to this change. The organization is certainly bigger and stronger and much better funded, and I'm sure that makes them proud and relieved. But what I most want board members to know is that having their support was always what kept me and the rest of the staff going. You didn't have a lot of millionaire friends to corral for donations, but you contributed your organizational contacts, your diverse experiences, and your professional credibility year after year after year. If people of experience and good sense and commitment to the issues were willing to keep coming to meetings and supporting our work and helping us make decisions like that, we had to be on the right track. So for me, the greatest gift of our board and its longest serving members was the validation they gave to the work and to me personally. I'm sorry that we have to do this virtually and that I can't give Mike and Mike and Bill each a hug, but please know that I'll always be grateful for our years together and hope that you each have many healthy and fulfilling years of retirement to come. Hi, I just want to say thank you for being on our board and serving the organization for as long as you have, especially because being on a board is such a thankless task. But it's because of your dedication that Safe and Just Michigan has been able to grow and accomplish all that we have. And it's because of you that we are now able to make such a difference in the lives of hundreds and thousands of Michiganders. Hi, Mike, Bill, and Mike. Thanks for serving SJM for so many years. Thanks for your commitment to criminal justice reform. During my 15 years of incarceration, I can't tell you how many times CAPS and now Safe and Just Michigan has made an impact on my life, whether it was a birthday card or the newsletter giving us some good news and hope. I can't thank you enough for myself and from the men and women behind bars for your work and your dedication. A little over three years ago, you took a chance on me. And one thing that I've learned is Without a good board backing the front-facing side of an organization, we wouldn't be able to make it. So for that, I want to say thank you. Mike, Mike, and Bill, thank you so much for all your years of service to Safe and Just Michigan. We are going to miss you, but you've put us in a great position to succeed, and we wish you the very best in your retirement. As the longest-serving CAPS Safe and Just Michigan employee, I've witnessed over many years your dedication to criminal justice reform. Even when progress was painfully slow, you hung in there and brought us to where we are today. Thank you for all the help and guidance you have given the organization over the years. You have helped make Safe and Just Michigan what it is today. I want to thank Mike, Mike and Bill for their over 50 years of combined service to Safe and Just Michigan. Thank you for your dedication and hard work in building and supporting this remarkable organization. When I think of boards, I think of the care they give, the loyalty they show, and the obedience they give to our mission. Thank you so much for all the care, loyalty, and obedience you've shown over the years. Thank you for your leadership, dedication, and for welcoming me to the organization over three years ago. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Kobina, and I am an associate professor at Michigan State University in the School of Criminal Justice. It has been my honor to serve the Safe and Just uh, Michigan Board for the past year. And tonight I will be facilitating uh, the Safe and Just Michigan Board election. And so as a guest this evening, we consider you all to be a member of our organization. So this allows you the opportunity to vote in our board election. So we have three individuals who are currently on our board who are seeking re-election for a three-year term. We also have three individuals, we also have three individuals seeking your nomination to our board for a three-year term. So I will first begin with the three board members currently seeking re-election. 
A poll will be launched to allow you to vote yes or no for this information, and you can find the poll tab on the right, uh, on the right of your screen next to the chat box. So first is Anna Khan. She is currently uh, Safe and Just Michigan's board president, and she is seeking re-election to our board for, three, uh, for a three-year term. Anna has served our board since 2014. She has supported the launch of dozens of nonprofits across the country, focusing on homeless, incarcerated, and impoverished populations. Anna is currently the chair of the Michigan Community Corrections Advisory Board. So please turn your poll uh, turn to your poll tab on the right-hand side of your screen to place your yes or no vote for Anna's re-election to the Safe and Just Michigan Board. All right, thank you. I see we have overwhelming support for her re-election to the board. Uh, the next board member seeking re-election for a three-year term to our board is Eileen Hayes. She has served our board since 2017. Eileen is the Executive Director of Michigan Faith in Action. She officially joined the staff in 2016 as a community organizer after nearly 10 years of volunteer leadership through her church's local organizing ministry. So please turn to your poll tab on the right-hand side of your screen to place your yes or no vote for Eileen's re-election to the Safe and Just Michigan Board. Awesome, thank you everyone. I see we also have a great deal of support for her re-election to the board. Next is Sherry Ware, who is seeking re-election to our board for a three-year term. She has served our board since 2017. Sherry is the founder of Still Standing, a faith-based domestic violence nonprofit agency in Detroit that serves men, women, and children who are affected by violence. Again, turn to your poll tab on the right-hand side of your screen to place your yes or no vote for Sherry's re-election to the Safe and Just Michigan Board. Awesome. I see we do. We also have vast support for her re-election to the board. And now I'm going to turn our um, our to our. I'm going to turn to our new board uh, member nominees. Each individual is seeking a first-time nomination to our board for a term of three years. First, we have Joe Havman, who is the director of government relations with a focus on prison reentry and veteran benefits at Hope Network, located in Grand Rapids. He is a former Republican politician who served uh, three terms in the, in the Michigan legislature. Again, turn to your poll tab on your screen to place your yes or no vote for Joe's election to the safe and just Michigan board. All right, it looks like there's a pattern here. We see uh, there is tremendous support for his election to the board. So we will move right along uh, to Jonathan Sachs, who is the director of the Michigan State Appellate Defender Office. Prior to this position, he served as the first executive director for the Michigan Indigent uh, Defense Commission. And this is work that culminated in Michigan's first minimum standard for indigent defense at trial and the submission of over 130 plans for counties and municipalities to comply with these standards. So turn to your poll tab on the right-hand side of your screen Place your yes or no vote for Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan's election to the Safe and Just uh, Michigan Board. Okay, thank you. I see we have overwhelming support for his election. Next is Craig Duroc, who, uh, who serves as Senior Vice President for Advocacy and Public Policy at Prison Fellowship. Uh, this is the nation's largest outreach to um, individuals who are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated individuals, and their families. He leads the organization's efforts to advance restorative criminal justice reform at both the state and federal level. So again, turn to your tab uh, and place your yes or no vote for Craig's election to the Safe and Just Michigan Board. Thank you, everyone. Again, I see we have uh, tremendous support for his election to the board. So I would like to uh, thank you all for participating in, th in this evening's board elections. We greatly appreciate your input into uh, what we know is this very important work here at Safe and Just Michigan. 
And so now I'm going to turn it over to our policy analyst, Josh Ho, and our featured guests. Hello, everybody. It's great to great to be here. I wish we could all be in person, but it's good to be here. Uh, hopefully, I saw both of our guests in the in the chat room, so hopefully uh, they'll be on here in just a second. I can start uh, introducing them a little before things start. Uh, Desmond Mead and Neil Voles are the dynamic duo behind Florida's Amendment 4 and the co-directors of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Uh, hopefully, uh, they'll be showing up in the room here in just a second. Oh, hey, Desmond. Hey, how's it going, Josh? Good. It's great hey. to see you. How you been? There you go. <laughs> How are you doing, man? Oh, listen, I, I'm tired. Uh, it's, it's It's been busy and hard work down here in Florida, but I'm still feeling uh, very hopeful. Uh, and I am excited about what's going to be happening in these next few weeks here in Florida. Well, for those who, uh, who are watching who might not know, I, I imagine there's not too many people don't know. Can you explain to everyone what Amendment 4 was? Yes, so Amendment 4, well, the best way for me to explain it is to talk about the conditions in Florida before Amendment 4. Uh, prior to passing Amendment 4, Florida was one of four states that permanently disfranchised American citizens, which meant that anyone convicted of a felony offense, no matter how serious or, or less serious that felony is, lost the right to vote at, along with their civil rights for the rest of their lives. Uh, there was a slim chance of people being able to get it back, but that's only through the clemency power of the governor. And um, a history of Florida have shown that that uh, power is not used too much. Um, but Amendment 4 uh, was a constitutional amendment that created an alternative pathway for people to be able to regain the right to vote back without having to grovel at the knees of any politicians. And so uh, we uh, uh, passed it with over 5.1 million uh, 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 people that voted yes on it and over 1.4 million returning citizens in Florida now have a pathway to being able to participate in our democracy. So let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, where did you all start this journey towards Amendment 4? And can you talk about the campaign and kind of your reflections on the journey before you got to celebrate passage? Well, you know, I mean, I think the journey for, for me started uh, in August of 2005 when I was homeless, addicted to drugs, and standing in front of railroad tracks waiting on the train to come so I could jump in front of it. Uh, and thankfully, uh, by, by the grace of God, the train didn't come that day, and I was able to cross those tracks eventually and, and, and uh, check into a drug treatment program and when I completed that, moving to a homeless shelter and from there, uh, going to school, eventually getting a law degree and, and uh, getting introduced to FRC uh, back in 2006, I believe, uh, and eventually uh, becoming the executive director and, of course, leading this effort. Uh, but the journey started at those railroad tracks. And then as far as the uh, ballot initiative itself, it happened uh, in 2011. Uh, when uh, then new governor Rick Scott came into office and the first thing he did was revise the clemency policies. The previous governor, Charlie Chris, uh, in four years was able to restore civil rights to include voting rights to over 155,000 people. And then this new guy comes in and uh, undo those policies and make it even more difficult. And just to show you, in eight years, he restored voting rights to less than 5,000 people in eight years. Uh, and so when that happened, it really demonstrated to me the, the seriousness of the issue. And what I mean by that is that you had four politicians that had that power to determine which American citizen get to vote and which American citizens don't get to vote. And I just thought that that was just too much power to be left in the hands of any politicians because that leave room for partisan politics to play a role in deciding uh, who gets to participate in our democracy. And so we knew we had to get some of that power out of the hands of these politicians. And we did so by actually uh, placing an amendment or amending our state constitution 
to create an alternative pathway. Now, to get this passed in a state like Florida, you had to put together a huge bipartisan coalition. I see Neil's joined us. Neil, can you talk about how the coalition came together? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, what was amazing was to just see the the the, the various component, you know, pieces of this coalition to come together. Uh, but ultimately, it started with a foundation of love um, and, and just an understanding that we were dealing with a broken system. And that, uh, man, for decades, politicians had promised to take steps or, you know, fix this problem and nothing ever happened. And there you have somebody like Desmond, you know, with a big vision and people who love their family members rallied behind this vision, this idea that the people could actually take power into their own hands and that it was this bond between individuals uh, that 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 was the glue behind this movement that continues to this day. This wasn't a partisan movement. This wasn't a political movement. This was a movement built on love and, and, and a belief that the system was so broken that the only way to fix it was for people to rally around from all walks of life, come together and, 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 and make a change. And man, I, we see that spirit alive and well today in the state of Florida, as people are rallying around the real lives of real people who have barriers in front of them uh, to full access to the community. Hey, Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Go ahead. Joshua, go ahead, Joshua. I, I do want to say one thing, though, because I remember uh, for, for so many times during the campaign, there were folks were like, oh, my Desmond, you, that's a great bipartisan campaign you guys are having. And I'm like, no, we're not a bipartisan campaign. Right? And then they try to fix it and say, okay, a nonpartisan campaign. Right? We're like, no, we're not that either. Uh, we were an organic grassroots campaign that welcomed and enjoyed bipartisan support. And the difference is, is that we led with the people and not with the politics, right? And so that's the thing that I think is, is so precious for us, even in the work that we're doing right now. Uh, and I know that we all have our preferences, we all have our ideologies, but at the end of the day, what's most important is our humanity, is, is, our, is our neighbor, right? And understanding that we have to constantly uh, have the courage, right? And, and the diligence to really make sure that we place the needs of the people above everything else. Yeah, and, and Joshua, can I just add to that? Because I love listening to kind of Desmond retell the, the story with, you know, on that, that night in November 2018, when Amendment 4 passed and 1.4 million people were liberated, you know, in the largest expansion of democracy in this country in the last 50 years, people didn't go to the voting booth and vote for a politician. They didn't go to the voting booth and vote for a partisan agenda. They didn't go and vote for an ideology. The end of the day, they went in and they voted for a loved one. They voted for their neighbor, for their friend, for their family member. Somebody who was dealing with a system that was so wildly broken, nobody could defend it. And they simply took a step forward in love. And so like those ties that bind, I saw y'all, I, I had so much fun to be a part of this and seeing you guys vote on board members and seeing, you know, the diversity of, of, of the community and what you guys are able to accomplish here in Michigan. Like that same kind of spirit is, is, is what's been propelling uh, progress in Florida. So Desmond, your coalition overwhelmingly wins the vote. There's a lot of celebration. And then only a few months later, the Florida legislator passed legislation clarifying that Amendment 4 actually meant that people could only vote after every bit of their criminal justice debt had been paid. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the hurdles that have been thrown in y'all's way since the amendment passed? Yeah, you know what? And, and I do, Joshua. But I, I think that we have a moment here to talk about something even bigger, right? About the arrogance of politicians, right? Just think about that. Just the arrogance of politicians. And I equate our story to the story of the homeless family that was living on the street for year after year after year. And the politicians kept walking past this family and did not lift a finger to help them. But then the people of the community came together and built them a house to live in. And the minute the people of the community built this family a home, politicians want to come in the home and dictate how it furnished, right? And that's ex exactly what happened with the arrogance of politicians that, that believed that we needed them to tell us how to implement something that they didn't even have the political courage to deal with to begin with, right? And when they did so, they went above and beyond, right, and created this 
uh, uh, enormous barrier of, 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 of financial uh, obligations that a person would have to pay before they could experience uh, the benefits of Amendment 4. And of course, because of their arrogance, they were soon hauled into court by the ACLU, Southern Poverty Law Center, Brennan Center, LDF, and so many more organizations. And they, they filed suit in the Northern uh, District Court uh, in Florida, and they actually won. Uh, where we had a judge, I mean, in beautiful language, plainly say that a lot of this, uh, these financial obligations were indeed a poll tax, and those that were not, you know, uh, it still uh, fell under the, the, the umbrella of the auspice of the fact that as a democracy, a person being poor should never be a barrier to having access to the voting booth. And, and, and it was a beautiful ruling. Uh, hundreds of thousands of returning citizens uh, were relieved, uh, but it was short-lived because the 11th Circuit uh, reversed uh, the lower court's ruling and sided with the state and now mandates that any returning citizen that have any outstanding legal financial obligation must first pay uh, or satisfy those obligations before being able to register to vote. Neil, did you want to add anything there? Or? Uh, yeah, just, just, you know, really that this idea that there's the culture and a spirit here that, that, that takes obstacles and says, hey, man, we see those obstacles as opportunities. Right? We see that in our, our, you know, our lives, our individual lives, and then kind of as a movement. And, I, and I'm sure that's, that's very similar here. Um, but what we saw was a few months ago, hundreds of thousands of returning citizens went to bed at night thinking they were going to be able to participate in democracy this year. Right. And, and I mean, for people who have been silenced, you know, people have been kicked to the curb. Those of us whose voices weren't being heard, man, that was huge. And so we had this movement on fire and then the appellate uh, court decides to shut that down. So three weeks ago, those hundreds of thousands of people found out they could not participate in democracy this year. And then we saw something really beautiful happen. We saw an incredible groundswell, a grassroots movement all across this country. Nearly 100,000 people decided to say, hey, you know what? There's a practical way for us to tear down those barriers to voting for people. And they donated over $26 million to help tear down barriers and restore eligibility for tens of thousands of returning citizens in Florida to have access to democracy. And they didn't, they weren't doing that for, you know, any reason aside from the fact that there's real love for people. And, and we see that it just like you guys do, when you focus on people and you give people an opportunity to jump over an obstacle, man, so many times they're, they're going to do it. The government might not do the right thing, Politicians might not do the right thing, but when given an opportunity, our friends and neighbors and people who see this fight for what it is are willing to step up. And we've seen that over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of people, uh, when faced with what you all have gone through, might have just thrown their hands up in frustration. Uh, but the coalition didn't quit. You rolled up your sleeves. You went back to work raising money to pay off the criminal justice debt of thousands of formerly incarcerated people. Can you share with everyone listening how much you have raised as of tonight? <laughs> yeah, we we've raised over twenty five million dollars, um, and and have paid out over twenty five million dollars, and it, it's it's such a beautiful thing. You know, listen, excuse me for getting on my soapbox, Joshua, but you know, I I think in all that we do, you know, the events of this year, if they haven't shown us anything else, it showed us two things. Number one that voting is literally the difference between life and death, right? And it, But it also shows us uh, the difference between politicians and public servants. And I say that because when we see uh, this political back and partisan back and forth, the people that suffer is us, right? The most beautiful moments during the COVID uh, uh, relief efforts have always been when everyday people from all walks of life just came to the, names of, uh, to, to, to the aid of their neighbor out of love, that, that, that we, we come together as a community. And, and those are so beautiful. And that's exactly what happened when the 11th Circuit reversed. Man, let me tell you, there was an outpouring of love from over 88,000 people across the country with an average donation of over $300 that said, we're gonna stand with you, Florida. And we, we believe that democracy should not be held hostage. We believe that no citizen should be forced to choose between putting food on their 
table or voting or, or paying a rent and mortgage or voting. And they stood up and let me tell you, $25 million, like it came in and as quick as it came in, we got it out the door uh, to make sure that people had access to democracy. And that's a beautiful thing. That was the story of all stories about how we can come together as a, as a community, how we really can come together as a country when we refuse to let politicians divide us and separate us and have us hating each other, being scared of each other, but rather when we could come together and love each other. So, Neil, uh, some of this has been unbelievable. Since you started raising money, you've gotten donations from LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Ariana Grande, and John Legend. There are a lot of crazy things happening. Can you kind of share a few moments that you'll always remember about the, the last few months? Yeah, man. Th thank you for that question. I mean, one thing I am, I, I, I'm reminded, and I, and I know that we're in a diverse audience here, right? But I'm just sharing my story, right? I, I'm a person of faith, and I think that God uses people who've been through something to do 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 greater things and to help the community. And, and I see verification of that in this movement and in this time, because it's amazing to see people who've been discarded by society, kicked to the curb, the underdogs, you know, who are rallying and leading this movement, right? And so it's really a joy and an honor to be here and talk about what's happening. But I think of, uh, you know, a story of there's a, a, a young lady or a lady who uh, some of our, our team met just a, just a month or so ago, who was getting a, a who was filling out her voter registration form. And she just really got emotional. And, and this story that I'm about to share really kind of resonated with all of us and our team and this movement and it kind of fed us um, and inspired us. And here she was, she's filling out this registration form and she hadn't voted in the longest time. And she shared that she had just gotten a diagnosis that she had six months to live. And she just asked and looked at our, our, our team and just asked to pray to God to, that she could make it to the election and that she, her voice could be heard that she wasn't you know praying and asking and wishing to go to disney world she wasn't praying to be you know meet a celebrity she wanted to feel like a full citizen she wanted to know that what that feeling was like now, i wish i could tell you that this story had a happy ending you know but the truth is we, we found out about two weeks ago from her family that she had gotten rushed to hospice and she died a couple days later and what it set in for all of us was the urgency and now you know, the belief that, hey, justice delayed actually is justice denied and that we should get up every morning. We should put our work boots on. We should get roll up our sleeves because this this fight is righteous. That this fight matters. And it's ultimately about people like her who simply wanted to be a full human being in her community and had paid the, her debt and was ready to move on. And that's something that's really worth fighting for. And those are the kind of memories, man, that we we hold on to real near dear here at FRC, Josh. I know this is our annual dinner, but how can people help your cause who are, who are watching right now? Wow. You know, they, can, they can go visit our website at floridarrc.com, uh, www.floridarrc.com, and there's an opportunity for them uh, to actually donate to our cause. And every uh, dollar help, uh, every dollar that we get goes towards uh, returning citizens and clearing the way uh, for them to be able to participate in democracy, to move on with their lives. Because even with some of these uh, uh, fines and fees uh, comes driver's license suspensions as well. And so people are finding it difficult to uh, find uh, good paying jobs, uh, find it difficult to get to and from work. And so we would greatly appreciate any donations. But Josh, I want to share uh, uh, but I know you were talking about like how LeBron James and Michael Jordan uh, and, and definitely John Legend, who has been the greatest champion of, of them all uh, towards our efforts. Uh, I wanted to share a crazy story because, you know, Neil, Neil is this white conservative guy, but I'm telling you, he got more cool points than I got, man. His, one of his favorite uh, groups is Public Enemy. Uh, go figure, right? Uh, but One of my favorite groups, too. <laughs> Just recently, uh, Chuck D was able to actually uh, um, uh, 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 get a part of, become a part of the conversation. I think Neil might have gotten a shout out or something like that. But, you know, that was a big thing there, you know, to see uh, some of our childhood celebrities, uh, people that we grew up listening to or watching on television, uh, just rally around. Uh, what's going on in, in, in Florida. 
And that's beautiful, man. You know, when, when the opponents, when the opposition try to stifle democracy, you know, I say it goes beyond, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's a poll tax. I say it goes beyond poll tax. I say that that's an affront to democracy, right? And when people try to do that, to see just people from all walks of life just stand up and say, I want to be counted in the number. I want to be a guardian of the galaxy, a guardian of democracy. It's such a beautiful thing, especially when it's Chuck D from Public Enemy, right now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hey, I, I, the truth I, on that story, Joshua, is, is Desmond was really helpful to his friend Neil and to get a shout out by my childhood teenage hero, Chuck D. I turned into a teenager all over again. My wife was both happy at, for me and laughing at me at the same time. I'm not going to lie. The proudest moment I ever had on Twitter was when Mr. Chuck D followed me on Twitter. That was like, that was like real. Uh, so I, I don't want to leave this out, Desmond. I saw some books behind you. Unless I'm mistaken, you may have just put out a book. Is that true? You, you are so true. Uh, let my people vote, man. And, and, and everybody, I want to encourage people to get a copy of this book, man. If you want to know about some of the inside thinking around Amendment 4, the what made us successful, if you want to know about how I overcame the drug addiction and the homelessness uh, to eventually get to where I'm at today, it is in that book. Uh, you should pick up a copy. It's a, it's a great read. Um, at least that's what Neil tells me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great read. Yeah. So, they can uh, get it at, um, they can get they can go to my website now. I have one, uh, DesmondMe.com, DesmondMe.com, or you can get it on Amazon and all these other fancy bookstores. Let my people vote. Put it in there. A nice little blurb by Stacey Abrams and Michelle Alexander, uh, author of The New Jim Crow who I uh, honored to have as a mentor and a friend. Well, you all were both nice enough to come on the Decarceration Not Nation podcast before, and you're certainly welcome to come back on to talk about the book. Well, when uh, are you going to give us an invite, man? <laughs> <laughs> for people who are organizing, this is a, we just have a few minutes left. For people who are organizing here in Michigan around these criminal justice issues, given your incredible successes, can you give everyone just a little bit of hope and some tips uh, for how you think people, you know, on organizing or moving forward or things you think are important. Just a couple things in the last few minutes we got. I mean, I mean I'll say something real quick and then I, I, Des can close because, I uh, mean, he, he's got so many, so much skill set in this area and has led for so long. Um, our, our belief is, is that, man, the people closest to the pain, right, should be the ones who are helping to make decisions and, and lead and strategize and help help with those organizing efforts and, and be at the heartbeat of those organizing efforts. Um, we're stronger together. We're better together. So I think it's great when we get our coalitions and we get lots of people. But at the end of the end of the day, man, I, that's, that's the thing that I always try and share with folks is, and if you've been through something, you got that experience. And, and you can do any part of this this work here. We can strategize, we can work on the ground, we can work above and and, and don't be held back by the idea that, you know, just because we made a mistake in our past, we can't play any role in this this process. Man, I think Nina said it all. This is one of the times he took all the words out of my mouth. But you know, you talk about giving words of inspiration and let me tell you something, I've seen uh, visions of inspiration, and I've heard words of inspiration by watching the video earlier, uh, just hearing some folks who are directly impacted, just seeing them and hearing their voices and seeing how they're really already plugged in, you know, is encouraging. You know, one of the things that I tell folks is that, you know, I, the main reason why I am proud of just being honored by Time Magazine is one of the 100 most influential people in the world is because, you know, I, I, I consider it an honor to stand as an example of how anyone that's watching right now, anyone that's hearing my voice, uh, have the capacity to do great things in your community, to do great things in this state and in this country. Uh, and, and, and I'm evidence of that, you know, I was that guy that was on the streets that people thought would never amount to anything. I was that guy who my own family member thought that I would be dying out there on those streets or, or, or locked up in the prison for the rest of my life. And if God 
and my high power can take me from there to where I'm at now, right? Then that means that that can happen to anyone. And it happens through the work that we put in. And the work that we put in have to be motivated by love. At the end of the day, you know, if love is not at the center of what you're doing, then we may need to rethink what, we, what it is that we're doing. But as long as love is at the center and you have a desire to serve others, you have a desire to want for your neighbor what you want for yourself and to make that become a reality, then you keep on pressing on and you keep on standing up and speaking out. And I'm telling you, if you commit yourself to doing that work, right, change will happen, right? And you're gonna be right there at the center of it. Uh, and I, I just wanna encourage the folks uh, who are returning citizens or formerly incarcerated people that's out there uh, to continue doing that work, continue in, in insisting on inserting yourself and being a part of the solution, being a part of the process. You do that, we win all day, all day. We go, in the words of DJ Khaled, all we do is win, 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 no matter what. Well, I want to say thank you to both of you. I love you both. Uh, look love forward to running into you again soon. And now it's uh, thanks again for doing this so much. And let me now turn it over to my good friend, Monica Jainer, who will be presenting the Milliken Award. My thank name you. is Monica Jainer. I am so humbled to be sitting so here today with you to be able to introduce such an amazing man. I am also the program director of Arrow in Lansing, which helps people re-enter after jail or prison. I started Arrow after coming home from prison myself and learning how hard it, it is to get back on your own feet. I decided to make this a career. I've seen how being in jail even a day or two can have a huge impact on someone's life. It can mean losing a job losing your car, losing your family, finding a place to live. The spiral and the dominoes are so hard to pull out of. When Governor Gretchen Whitmer set up this task force to reduce the state jail's population in early 2019, I heard that they were going to put a, a formerly incarcerated person on the um, task force. And I, I started making all kinds of phone calls to figure out how I could become part of this task force. It was extremely important for me to be on be part of this um, task force. So I was so humbled when Jonathan Sachs from State Appellate Defender's Office called me and gave me an interview for this opportunity. When the governor's office called me uh, to inform me that I had been appointed to the task force, I asked them if they had dialed the wrong number. We were lucky to uh, be led by Michigan Supreme Court Chief Justice Bridget Mary McCormick and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist II. My first interaction with Lieutenant Governor was a very memorable one for me, and I have to share this. I was worried that I would miss out on the first task force meeting because I had previous, previously arranged my trip to the San Diego Comic-Con. I was getting ready to take a photo with a cardboard AOC, and, and AOC had just been, um, had got her own comic um, storyline, and here's the Lieutenant Governor calling me as I'm standing with a major controversial representative. In his polite voice, the lieutenant governor asked me, should I call you back? And I thought about the irony of the lieutenant calling me at that moment, and I said, no, sir, I'll find a quiet place to speak. I couldn't let that moment pass. I didn't personally meet the lieutenant governor until the task force first meeting, but I came to truly appreciate him as I followed him from the day um, Gretchen Whitmer announced that she was, he was going to be her running mate. Mr. Grill Gilcrest listens and brings people together to get things done. He's rarely the loudest voice in the room, but don't let that fool you. He's paying a lot of attention and he has something to say. The Lieutenant Governor spearheaded up the task force on the Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities. And last week, the Michigan Department of Human Health and Human Services showed significant progress had been made reducing the desperate impact on COVID-19 that it had on the communities of color. The governor stated that the aggressive action taken in Michigan has helped dramatically reduce the number of African Americans who have been impacted by the COVID-19. The lieutenant governor was a great mediator. He played devil's advocate. He helped us to understand where the other person came from and how to reach some agreements. He did that time and time again. He ran interference between our task force and the legislator between us and the attorney general's office and even the media. He's the big part of the reason why our task force came up with the list of 18 recommendations 
some of which are now have already been voted out of the House and the Senate. I will never forget the day that we voted, that the task force voted on our recommendations. We had the opportunity to go see Just Mercy at a private showing created uh, with RISE. And after watching that traumatizing and enlightening movie, the Lieutenant Governor and other task force members and myself had the best conversation about racial and criminal justice issues related to the movie. Listening to the Lieutenant Governor gave me a new appreciation and respect for him and his plight. And his commitment to criminal justice reform goes beyond the task force. He showed up to testify in favor of the Clean Slate legislation, which was a champion by Safe and Just Michigan in partnership with diverse coalitions. His expertise was especially useful there. That's because before becoming active in the sphere of politics, Mr. Gilcrest worked in technology. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer engineering and computer science from the University of Michigan, graduating with honors, no doubts. He helped build Microsoft SharePoint in the company's fastest growing product ever. He put his skills, his skills to the causes he cared about, serving as a social media manager for President Barack Obama in the 2008 campaign in Washington State. Mr. Gilchrist later came back to his, to his hometown to be, in, be Detroit's Director of Innovation and Emerging Technology. In his role, he used his technology to address concerns in his community, including developing an app that let people report broken streetlights, potholes, and other problems to the city. This knowledge and experience have proven invaluable in the Lieutenant Governor's office. For instance, he helped navigate technical difficulties raised by automatic expungement in the Clean Slate legislation. We are so grateful for his expertise and his help, and we look forward to seeing what he has in store for um, Michigan the rest of his term. Safe and Just Michigan is proud to present Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist II with the 2020 Governor William G. Milliken Award. Hey, so I believe we've got the LG now. Lieutenant, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much. And we're very pleased to give you the Milliken Award this year. You've done so much to advance criminal justice in Michigan. Um, we just, we appreciate you and we appreciate you making time, especially on a very busy day. Oh my gosh. Well, um, <laughs> well, well, thank you so much. First of all, it's a tremendous honor. Um, I really think that, um, yeah, for me, this is, this is really about safe and just, I mean, um, your advocacy on so many areas of reforming the criminal legal system, um, has really been a boon to me as a, as a new public servant. Um, you know, I, I never been elected to office before. But uh, uh, trying to make sure that I can, you know, sort of govern with values. But you you can't just govern with values. You also have to have information and allies. And Safe and Just has really been a true and tremendous ally uh, to me as I've really dug into these issues of criminal justice reform and what we can do, whether it was on um, jail reform and leading the task force with the chief justice um, and making sure that we could, um, you know, really, again, combine um, our values with uh, the data and evidence on the system that, frankly, everyone knew was broken, but nobody fully understood in a quantitative way. Um, and so having the partnership of Safe and Just to work with us and Pew and everyone to make sure that we could go in a good direction with that was great. And then I think the the, the a big one that I'm very proud of is the work that was done on um, Clean Slate. Um, we have passed um, and has been officially signed into law um, the most progressive and expansive um, automated record clearance system uh, in the country. And that is a testament to the work of people who have been fighting for this for years. Um, and I'm happy to, to come and to, to help and to lend my voice and be an ally uh, in, in my office and in my capacity as Lieutenant Governor to show that the state of Michigan um, can and will be a place for opportunity. I said at a speech in, in January of this year that I wanted, um, to how, do we, how we wanted to define the next decade in Michigan is Michigan to be the place that moves ideas and opportunities. And one of the ways that people can have opportunity to move their ideas in Michigan is by having a chance to fully participate and compete in our economy. That is all we ask for from someone, to remove the barriers that prevent people from participation. That's what all of our policies at the end of the day, that's what they need to do. They need to make it more possible for more people to participate in more things. 
And so this automated record expungement package called Clean Slate is really, I think, um, one that will benefit hundreds of thousands of Michiganders and giving them full access to the economy to be able to unlock their full potential here in Michigan. I don't want people to feel like they have to go somewhere to be the person they want to be, the professional that they want to be, the entrepreneur they want to be. I want people to know that that is fully available to them right here in the state of Michigan. And so I think that the the, the systems, the, the reforms that we are working to push in the criminal legal system are done with an eye toward that. Um, it, it aligns with the other stuff I care about related to connecting our communities better, whether it's through internet access, transit and transportation, you name it. And so um, I am really honored to receive uh, this award um, named for Governor Milliken, um, or as I like to call him, Lieutenant Governor Milliken. Um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the, the, the example that he set and that he showed as far as the fact that, um, you know, when you decide to get to work and get things done, um, the, the, the desire and the ability to get things done is a transpartisan thing. It's not even bipartisan. It is beyond partisanship because it's bigger than that. And I try to think about that with my service. While nobody would be confused as to what party I'm part of or what part of the progressive political movement that I come from and that I have worked in, um, I've been in the dirt as a community organizer fighting for social, economic, and racial justice across the country. So nobody would be confused about that. And at the same time, um, I don't think anyone is confused as we have pushed as, as the issue areas that have been my priority, internet access, criminal justice reform, have also been um, the most productive areas of bipartisan consensus in this, you know, relatively contentious 100th Michigan legislature. So I think it speaks to the fact that when you lead with values and, and, and approach to getting things done, um, then you can accomplish a great deal. And I think that's what standing tall truly means. I think that's what uh, Governor slash Lieutenant Governor Milliken represented uh, as a leader and an example and a model for a public servant. And so I'm, I'm really humbled to, to receive this award from Safe and Just, uh, from my friends at Safe and Just uh, in his honor. So thank you so much. And I know we got a lot more work to do, y'all, and I'm proud to do it alongside you. Hey, we, there's no one we'd rather do the work with. Uh, and thanks so much for making time for us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, you know, keep up the great work. We, we appreciate you. No doubt, y'all. Y'all be safe. Everybody take care, okay? All right. Thanks a lot, LG. Take care. Bye. And uh, to close us out here, our, our board chair, Anna Cohn, is going gonna, is gonna to come back and give some closing remarks. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, for joining us this evening. We're honored to continue working in partnership to ensure a future where everyone is safe in their own communities. Your continued advocacy among justice-involved populations is deeply appreciated. I also want to extend a special thanks to our keynote speakers, Desmond Mead and Neil Volz of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. To our members and guests, we want to thank you for your time and patience with our new format this evening. Even in the face of challenges, Safe and Just Michigan will always find a way to keep our members engaged and informed. Your loyal membership contributions and annual donations allow us to provide the most up-to-date information and evidence-based research to the public, but we cannot do it without you. From reforming the way Michigan establishes sentencing policies to convening community meetings across the state, we're so pleased to continue partnering with you and your loved ones as we move on to our next 20 years. Please consider making your tax-deductible donation to Safe and Just Michigan this evening by clicking on the button below. I'm thrilled to continue working with both current and newly elected board members, and I'm especially grateful to the phenomenally committed staff of Safe and Just Michigan for allowing our impact to be felt across the state. As we close for the evening, it's my pleasure to introduce two of the team members that make me proud to work with Safe and Just Michigan, Rick Speck and Troy Reenstra, for some final remarks. Love to hear folks' stories about how safe and just has impacted them. Well, as I stated earlier in the video, the thank you video, uh, unfortunately, I served three sentences spanning 18 and a half years of my life, the last one lasting 15 years. And in many ways, CAPS and now SJM has made a huge impact on my life when I was incarcerated. Um, as I stated earlier, whether it was a birthday card or being able to help me with things that I was fighting for and organizing against inside the injustices that we faced then. And then when I came home, uh, being invited uh, as a member of Lucky to the formerly incarcerated round table, you know, that helped me to transition back and really feel a part of this community. 
And then um, later on, when I went to work for the ACLU, this position uh, came available after being there about 18 months. And it was probably one of the hardest decisions I had to make. But, um, you know, I decided to leave the ACLU and join this team, and I look forward to doing this work for many years with all of you folks. Troy, how about you? You want to share a little bit about your story with uh, SJM? I do, man. You know, I got great stories. I keep a great story in my pocket. So for me, after entering into the juvenile justice system at 15 years old, not being out from correctional controls in the past 35 years, uh, today I have five days before I complete my four-year parole after serving 22 years in a life term. When I came home from prison in October 13th, 2016, uh, I reached out to Laura Steger and the Caps team, went and hugged everyone there except for John. He was the only man in the house, shook his hand and told them all, just thank you for your work. I read all their newsletters. I, 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 I was inspired that there were people outside of prison who cared about us and who were fighting so hard. And so I was given the opportunity to work for Caps and now Safe and Just Michigan. And this was the first job I ever had in my life. And so for that, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm grateful that they helped me in my development. Uh, here we are now with Nation Outside coming under our auspices, working in a partnership and looking forward to what the future brings for them uh, because they definitely will, will become a, a, a grassroots force in this state. So I just wanna thank everybody here tonight for giving us the opportunity to share our work with you, our stories. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Desmond. I, I don't know if you recall, but we met in Atlanta, Georgia, and you asked me if I was directly impacted, and I told you I was so impacted. So, Rick, you have any last thoughts before we close out for the evening? No, just tonight was just a just inspiration after inspiration. Um, just so humbled to occupy these the space with you folks, and um, you know we definitely want to thank our folks at Michigan Creative tonight for producing this event. Um, couldn't have done it without you. And so, um, yeah, that, that's what I'd like to share. And then we'd like to turn it over to Eileen for our closing blessing. Thank you. Thank you all for a great evening. Being patient with us. Yes. So inspiring. So great to see so many folks in the chat tonight. Just awesome. Hey, I Hi, Eileen. Hi, Troy. Great job, everybody. So many great presentations. Congratulations to the Lieutenant Governor. Um, wonderful job by Desmond and Neil. So inspiring. But as we've learned tonight, much has been done in spite of all the obstacles that we face with COVID-19. But as Neil said, the obstacle becomes the opportunity. We count it all a blessing. As people of faith, we say, but God. We know much remains to be done. We know democracy is on the ballot. Health care is on the ballot. Criminal justice is on the ballot. But there is good news. We can vote. We can work together. And great things can be inspired with great joy and great prayer and great hope. So as we prepare to leave this virtual space, we wish you all safe virtual travels and safe physical encounters. May God continue to watch over you as you do this great work. And we will, as Desmond said, we will win no matter what. <laughs>